Hola, hola, my name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm -hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, Jesse Collings. Got a solo episode today. We're going to be doing a mailback episode. Um, and I really want to thank so many people for sending in not only questions, but really good questions. Questions that I think we can have a good discussion about and when i say we can have a good discussion about i mean i'm going to answer them and whoever's listening to this will just have to hear what i have to say so it's really not going to be that much of a discussion if i'm being honest it's just going to be my thoughts um but really good set of questions uh, a lot of diverse kind of topics a lot of it's big picture stuff which is kind of what this podcast covers so i appreciate that getting questions that are kind of in the theme of some of the recent episodes that we've had and some of the other topics that we've covered here on this show. And I don't know how long this is going to take me to answer all of these questions. It may take an hour and may take three hours. I'm sure you can look at this, the length of this audio file and be able to determine how long it took me to answer these, but I'm going to try to answer them as thoroughly as possible with a, a mind that I cannot be here all day answering them. But I really do appreciate so many questions being asked, and again, high quality ones. Um, in the future, if you're listening to this and you want to know how can I ask a question uh, if I do another mailbag, which I probably will do, you can uh, DM me on Twitter at Jesse Collings. Uh, I usually put out a tweet that people can uh, reply to, too. Some of the uh, questions from today came from a reply to tweets. Um, you can also find me at uh, uh, in the Voices of Wrestling Discord, where I got a lot of these questions from. I know I put it in the uh, the channel in the Discord for the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, and people send in a lot of their questions that way. You can also be, feel free to DM me um, on, on, on Discord if you don't want your question to be made public. Uh, but those are generally the, the best ways to get in touch with me if, if you do want to ask a question. But we're going to get started here. The first question I have is from Gerard Di Trollio. And Gerard, of course, is uh, one of the co-hosts of the Emerald Flow Show here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And Gerard asks, is there a story or trend in wrestling from this year that you think is underanalyzed or not talked about a lot that will have a major impact long-term to the business. The first thing that comes to mind in terms of something that I think is being maybe under-discussed that may be having a long-term effect on the business is the past year in the trend of WWE reaching younger viewers. I think there's been a lot of focus put on WWE uh, increase in ratings, especially for SmackDown um, in NXT. But the one of the reasons they're gaining ratings is because they're attracting a lot more younger viewers. The audience is younger than it was last year. And that is a very unusual trend. We've seen wrestling audiences get older and older and older pretty much for the last two decades. And the past year is really the first time we've seen that trend shift for WWE where they have maybe lost some older viewers, but have gained a lot more younger viewers. And I want to focus on NXT in particular because out of all of the the shows WWE has, NXT has this audience that used to be super old. Everyone was making jokes about how the average NXT viewer remembers the Kennedy assassination and things like that. 
But that is not the case anymore. The show is skewering much younger. It's still older uh, relative to some other wrestling shows, but their audience is getting a lot younger. And a lot of it is, you know, growth in the 18 to 34 and the teenage um, demographics. And that's a really interesting trend because obviously since they kind of rebranded to NXT 2.0, they've been aimed at trying to attract younger viewers and they've got all these wacky characters and this bad sitcom acting. And it's always been talked about, like I watched some of these segments like with like Thea Hale and JC Jane and all these people and Chase You And I always think, you know, who are these segments for? Because they're terrible. They're unlike anything else in wrestling. They're not aimed for wrestling fans. They can't be. But the answer is they're probably aimed at teenagers and they're probably aimed at people that maybe don't have a lot of experience watching pro wrestling. So their definition of what to expect uh, when they turn on a pro wrestling show is different than if, you know, you or, or I turn on a pro wrestling show. And I think that might be connecting with younger viewers. And I think that I get the sense in a way that like, NXT might be attracting the way they present their characters. They might be attracting viewers that maybe otherwise would be watching like Freeform or um, like the teenage, you know, girl shows on Netflix or things like that. They seemed aimed at more like teen melodrama than uh, aimed at, you know, the typical wrestling fan. And the result has been a younger viewership for NXT and a, wider viewership for NXT and really being able to cultivate investment from a demographic that really hadn't responded that well to pro wrestling previously. And I wonder if that is a trend that's going to catch on. If we're going to see those fans that maybe are getting introduced to pro wrestling through NXT, or at least getting more, um, I imagine most of them are somewhat familiar with pro wrestling before they turn on NXT. I doubt NXT is a true entry point, but find themselves becoming more invested in pro wrestling through the characters of NXT. Um, and if we see both WWE's main roster and then presumably other wrestling promotions copy the presentation in NXT, which, you know, as a fan, I think would be terrible, but that is something that I think about the business going in. And I think about that growth in the younger demographics for NXT and all the, you know, the smart people are going to study that and they're going to try to figure out how they can achieve similar growth. That's just the way any business works. And I think that's something that a lot of people are ignoring. And when we talk about perhaps AEW mimicking WWE in some ways and some of the way their characters are presented. And I can tell like those MJF Adam Cole skits, like the skit when they were on the boat that aired last night, um, that's ripped right out of NXT. Now, is that, oh, we're going to copy what NXT is doing? I don't know. Who knows? But it's something that would fit right into the NXT playbook. And I, again, I don't know if that's direct copying, but I do know that NXT's growth will have people paying attention to what they're doing. And when they're doing that, they're going to find ways to mimic that. And I think that's definitely something that maybe a lot of people don't realize at the moment in terms of what could have a long-term impact on the business. But that's something that I think is worth paying attention to and following closely, um, especially if their viewership numbers continue to hold up uh, you know, as time goes on. Uh, NC Kyle asks... Do you think there is anything to the Dion effect in college sports that will impact pro wrestling, both positive or negative? Local sports radio today was talking about how all these coaches are catching on to Dion cutting promos and how distinct he's become because of it. If college football and other sports become more pro wrestling like, then how will pro wrestling, for better or worse, respond? Um, so obviously, NC Kyle here is referring to Deion Sanders, who is the coach of the University of Colorado football team. And uh, if you're not like American or you haven't been following college football, Deion Sanders is a former, uh, very high profile, famous NFL player from the 80s and 90s, uh, who has kind of seen a, himself have a meteoric, me meteoric rise in college football coaching. And he's, you know, very flamboyant in public and like he essentially does cut pro wrestling promos um, when he's doing media interactions and things like that. Um, so NC Kyle is asking if kind of 
making that kind of like a mainstream aspect of sports presentation, if that's going to impact pro wrestling. Um, and, and how will pro wrestling respond? It's an interesting question. I would say like, not as much Dion, but like MMA in particular is already like wrestling. You have these people that are playing characters. They have people that are uh, cutting promos. Like Conor McGregor is essentially a pro wrestling character. Um, the difference between whether it's Deion Sanders or Conor McGregor or someone in, in sports and wrestling is that people in that generally watch sports believe that this is real. They don't really think about, oh, this person's playing a character that they way the way they would in pro wrestling. And that is a huge difference because people are much more willing to suspend their disbelief to get um to, to to so so people will believe that oh they're being serious as opposed to pro wrestling which people who aren't pro wrestling fans will just immediately dismiss as oh this is fake pro wrestling why would i care what this person is saying um it's a really interesting dynamic in the sense of the number one thing anyone knows about pro wrestling is that it's fake ask any person they might not know a single thing in the world about pro wrestling but you say what do you what do you think about pro wrestling and they will probably say well isn't it fake or you know it's fake. And that undermines like a lot of like the character work that people talk about in pro wrestling in terms of connecting with the mainstream audience because people are not willing, the average person that is not a pro wrestling fan is not necessarily willing to suspend their disbelief to believe in a pro wrestling character. But for whatever reason, they are willing to suspend their disbelief when it comes to a quote unquote real sports figure that is clearly playing a character and clearly saying things to get attention and to rile people up and things like that. And so I don't really see a relationship between the two. I do think that like MMA, like in the early two, in the mid 2000s and in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, MMA has perhaps stolen some people that otherwise would be pro wrestling fans because fans believe that MMA is real and MMA also provides the kind of, you know, fake storylines and personalities and eventually being settled through combat that pro wrestling used to provide to people um i was watching the uh, uh tito ortiz and chuck liddell 30 for 30 documentary that came out a number of years ago and the way people will talk about that whole rivalry that they had and they talk about oh these two guys they would give media interviews and they would talk about how much they didn't like each other and then dano who's the supposed to be running things he's in the middle of it and it's just this and the, and the way they talk about that feud, they talk about it like it's this amazing, incredible concept. And at the time, it definitely was in terms of MMA presentation because it did huge business and in a lot of ways helped put UFC on the map. But when I was watching it, I was like, these people are just doing a basic pro wrestling angle. But because it's not pro wrestling, people think it's like this innovative, amazing thing. And I've always found that dynamic really fascinating because I, I, I'll i talk to like, like my mom or my sister's and they'll watch like Real Housewives or Love Island or these like trashy reality shows where these people are obviously playing characters and they're manufacturing feuds. And I'll be like, you guys know that this is fake, right? Like, you know that these people don't really like each other and you shouldn't be wondering like, oh my God, I can't believe she did that to her because this is all just written performative stuff pretending to be real. But for whatever reason, that doesn't resonate with people. Um people who are otherwise would be critical of pro wrestling are willing to overlook obvious, you know, kayfabe moments outside of pro wrestling for whatever reason. So I don't really think the Dion effect will have uh, any impact on pro wrestling. Um, people like Muhammad Ali, you know, li openly lifted a lot of their personalities from pro wrestling. And that's 50 years ago. Um, I think in some ways, pro wrestling needs to evolve. I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from MMA that pro wrestling could take in terms of at least trying to present the drama as more realistic than what we see a lot of the times in American pro wrestling, uh, where it's often manufactured and, and the, the violence is over the top in terms of what people are willing to do to each other. And uh, it's it's a kind of a different ball game, but I don't really see it having that big of an impact. Uh, on pro wrestling. 
Uh, Diego Garcia asks, is over exposition in US TV wrestling true in the main event scenes of a wrestling promotion? Um, I think what Diego is asking here when he talks about over exposition is the necessity to go over the top to explain motivations. Um, and the two examples that I think most people will look at will be the bloodline uh, and kind of in a similar vein, the MJF and Adam Cole storyline in AEW. And when we talk about over exposition, right, we're talking about like, you know, Roman Reigns is in a match against Sami Zayn and he's cutting a promo for everyone to hear saying, you know, you could have been one of us. You, I could have given you everything, but you had to turn your back. And it's like this over the top, unnecessary explanation for character motivations. And, you know, MJF and Adam Cole is very similar in the sense of, you know, MJF is, uh, he's got the title belt and he gives it to Adam Cole. And he says like, oh, this is what you wanted. Our friendship didn't mean anything. It was all about the title. And I guess this, we could be considered this to be relatively new in pro wrestling, at least, uh, you know, this style of storytelling. And personally, I don't like it. I think you could tell these stories without needing the wrestler to cut like an in-ring promo explaining the motivations and hammering everyone over the head with what's going on. It makes everything feel unnatural and kind of what I was just touching at in terms of pro wrestling needing to uh, make the, the drama feel more real. Like you wouldn't see um, these guys in an MMA fight who maybe were having a feud over something in the press conference, like cutting a, a promo against each other, like while they're trying to fight each other. They're, all their attention and focus is put on destroying their opponent, not explaining it to the audience. Um, so personally, I'm not a huge fan of this kind of storytelling and, and exposition, as Diego says. But strategically... I don't know if it is a problem uh, and it's something that that wrestling companies should stop doing because the reality is, is that the audiences seem to be responding to this kind of storytelling. I think part of the reason you have so many people talking about the bloodline being this incredible story is because it's so over explained to the audience that even the slowest of belt mutants can keep up with it. And when they say this is the greatest wrestling story of all time, I think what they're really saying is this is the wrestling story that's been explained and explored the most to me, the viewer. Um, and that's because you can't go a second without watching a match where these guys don't tell you the story again. And I mean, tell you the story. Wrestling used to be a business that was about show. Don't tell. Show your emotions. Show that you're willing to go over the top to defeat this opponent. You can show that through aggression and simulated combat. You don't need to do a Shakespeare in the park level uh, monologue about why you're destroying your opponent, why you're motivated to do these things. Um, but for whatever reason, a lot of fans have responded to that. Look at the business that the Budline has done and, and these big Roman Reigns matches have done and the interest in things like you know, the trial of the Usos or Roman Reigns going on trial or uh, the tribal chief council or whatever, you know, talking segment that they have on SmackDown and look at how some of those, uh, the ratings, some of those uh, events have drawn. And, you know, the MJF quarter hours are always very strong. So it does seem like something that a lot of audiences are responding to towards and wrestling, as much as we want to talk about wrestling, oh, you can be subtle and things like this. That's not really the pro wrestling business. The pro wrestling business is never going to be, uh, you know, the medium of pro wrestling is never going to be perfect for subtle storytelling. It kind of always has to be over the top and bombastic because it's ultimately a sloppy way to tell stories. It's not like a book or a two hour movie or a play or something like that. It's, it's a pro wrestling show. So there's always going to be a certain lack of nuance to the storytelling that's going on. It doesn't mean that we can't do better, but I always think that, uh, you know, pro wrestling is, is going to be pretty simply told stories. Uh, and, and honestly, I think a lot of the most effective promos are like a guy going out and just saying, I don't like you. This is why I don't like you. And I'm going to beat your ass. 
those are like basically the tenets of our best promos that we see on a week to week basis. So I don't think it's a, a bad thing to be so direct, but do we need to have promos in, during a match and just this over the top explanation? I don't think so. Personally, I'd like to see it all go away, but I also understand why wrestling companies are doing it. And again, like I kind of talked about when I answered the first question, when wrestling companies see that this is working, they're going to mimic it and copy it. And you're going to see a lot more of it. Um, and until it kind of proves that it doesn't work anymore, um, we're probably going to see a lot more different versions of it. So I don't think this is going to change. Um, but that's a very good question, Diego. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Twitter. Common Sense on Twitter asks, is it time for people to start criticizing WWE in good faith again? Recently, their products have been tons of rematches, lack of storyline progression, directionless main eventers, and last but not least, returns and debuts, mainly of The Rock and John Cena, to inject excitement. Well, Common Sense, I can tell you right now, I have on this podcast and on any podcast that I've appeared on, it is always time to criticize WWE in good faith because even though business has been very strong, there's still many reasons to criticize the company. Uh, but recently, uh, I, I definitely agree that their products have been really focused on too many rematches and lack of storyline progression in directionless main eventers, all the things that you said there. I find the product right now to be very dry and uncreative. And people are starting to catch on to that. We've seen a lot more complaints about how the main event of Raw, like for the last like three months, has been basically some combination of Cody and Sammy and Kevin Owens, you know, versus the Judgment Day. And that's kind of been the main event picture for, for Raw for a long time. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of progression. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of direction for some of these people other than just have endless rematches. Uh I think that they're really uh, not putting forth a lot of effort into creative feuds. I think we're headed into our second pay-per-view that's probably going to be headlined by Seth Rollins versus Shinsuke Nakamura uh, World Title Challenge. And I just don't see any reason for that. Uh, Nakamura is not an exciting main event wrestler anymore, let alone him getting one main event uh, at a pay-per-view is is surprising and now he's getting two it just seems really unnecessary i think cody is way colder than he was um back at wrestlemania and, and you know when he was feuding with brock because as absurd as like the motivations of the brock feud were at least the fact that cody had a long feud with brock lesnar kept him relevant and made him seem like he was a top star still with Brock out of the picture and him on Raw no longer being able to really chase Roman Reigns to the title and Cody's character apparently unable to, for creative reasons, unable to uh, challenge Seth Rollins for his title, there's really nothing for Cody to do because they are very thin on top of credible main event challengers. And so we have Seth wrestling Nakamura twice and really nothing for Cody to do other than just kind of vaguely feuding with Judgment Day. So I think there's a lot of issues with the WWE creative at the moment uh, in terms of presenting a product. I think I go back to SummerSlam and as, although I have plenty of problems with the WWE product, SummerSlam was a well-booked pay-per-view leading up to it. You had feuds that had time to develop and there was a lot of appropriate focus on them. You had things like Cody versus Brock and Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns and even something like a Logan Paul versus Ricochet. You have these real feuds with, with some fire into them. And kind of since SummerSlam, they have really haven't had that strong creative direction. I don't know why that is, um, but obviously with Roman not really being around, that hurts SmackDown. And SmackDown, who's doing, SmackDown's doing great attendance numbers right now. And that is so obviously John Cena coming back and carrying SmackDown attendance. He's such a huge draw in that realm. And he's, I mean, they, they did the huge rating for The Rock, which you expect, but The Rock, I don't think he's going to be around. He hasn't been around since, and he's probably not going to be around that much in the future. I know the, the Hollywood strikes are ending, so John Cena's probably not going to be around that much in the future. So it'll be very interesting to see what SmackDown looks like after uh, Cena goes back. And I assume Reigns is going to have to come back. He's probably going to have to wrestle a match at Survivor Series, I would think, or maybe the Saudi Arabia show. Um, so we're going to kind of see what they have creatively for them. But it does seem like WWE just kind of ran out of ideas. And they're starting to get more criticism aimed at them. Obviously, I've always been critical of them, but you're starting to see maybe more of the uh, 
uh, more WWE neutral people um, or even WWE fans uh, a little bit frustrated with the direction of, of Raw, especially, and a little bit uh, to a lesser degree SmackDown, but still there hasn't really been a ton of development. So I agree that we're starting to see more of that criticism and we're going to see more of it unless things change. Um, these are kind of two questions. I, I arranged them to be asked back to back because um, they're very similar, but I'll start with the first one. This one is from Twitter. It's from Wembley was it. Um, not sure what that means, but this is their, that's their Twitter username. So Wembley was it. Uh, that's probably a British, uh, British term. Now I think about it. It's, is that like a, uh, is that like a, you know, I thought he was kind of saying that Wembley was lit, but it, this just says Wembley was it. Um, so I don't really know what that means, but, uh, they asked, what do you think it would take for a foreign company to get hot in the U S like new Japan pro wrestling did in 2023, the market seems saturated, but sometimes different and new can break in. I think the main reason new Japan pro wrestling, uh, broke out in, in America 10 years ago was, because there was a real interest in wrestling that WWE wasn't providing. And you can look at the growth of both New Japan Pro Wrestling and Ring of Honor in the United States and see how it lines up with the demise and the collapse of Impact Pro Wrestling as a, as a major competitive wrestling company that people focused on and by the the early 2010 early 2010s and the mid certainly by the mid 2010s when new japan started to take off you know impact had really burned a ton of you know loyal viewers by consistent bad creative and other aspects and obviously they lost several different their television was bouncing around all over the place and it wasn't stable uh, a lot of people focus on like wwe losing uh fans during that time period as the main reason that other companies like Ring of Honor and New Japan grew. But I think almost equally important was Impact going down and kind of creating a space for an alternative brand to emerge. And that that and it did in, in New Japan and Ring of Honor, which obviously presented a wrestling product that was very different than what WWE was presenting at the time. And, and even different than what Impact had been presenting at the time. And that resonated with a lot of disenfranchised viewers. Now, fast forward to 2023, uh, you have, not only do you have WWE seemingly stronger than ever, but you also have the strongest non-WWE company we've had in this country in over 20 years at AEW. So I don't see a huge demand for another pro wrestling company. Um, and so a foreign company, um, I don't see how they could really get big in the U.S. because I don't think that the demand for an alternative wrestling company is nearly as strong as it was eight to ten years ago. Um, if I were to say, like, what would be the most likely thing to do that, I would think the only one that kind of comes to mind is, like, a Joshi company really taking off in America. And I think that would be very different than the way New Japan took off, where I think New Japan took off because it was a really strong wrestling product that resonated with hardcore wrestling fans. I think Joshi could take off because it could connect with non-wrestling fans, particularly your, 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 your typical weeps, your, your anime and manga fans uh, in the United States. Um, that uh, market is huge. I was in a, a public library yesterday um, for, for my shoot job and it was a brand new library and I was in their teen room and they have a huge teen room at this new library and quite literally half of the teen room's book selection, which I don't know, I would have hazard a guess as being about 250 to 300 books was manga. Um, and I was, and I, and it didn't really surprise me, but it did kind of hammer home how big that market is for teenagers right now. Um, in manga everyone knows anime is huge and it seems to be growing and so i think joshi which you know japanese women's wrestling which is presents pro wrestling in a completely different way than any other company in the united states does i think that they could theoretically tap into an audience that has never watched pro wrestling before 
Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't like, I've heard other people say like wrestling companies should really be exploring going to like anime conventions and things like that, because I do think I could see it happening. I think there's a lot of Japanophiles in the United States, um, and in other Western countries. And I think there's a world where a Joshi promotion or something like Kaiju big battle, or just something so different than, than regular pro wrestling, um, could connect with an audience that doesn't watch pro wrestling right now or doesn't really watch pro wrestling right now. Um, I do know that there are like Joshi fans that are kind of only Joshi fans. They never really watched other types of pro wrestling. Um, but if I were to say like, what is a foreign company that could do that, that could grow in the United States and end up drawing like 5,000 fans to an event like New Japan Pro Wrestling was doing, I would say like, it, it would have to be something kind of outside of the typical wrestling fan uh, to get that. I mean, you could say like a Lucha companies, like people have been talking about this for decades. Um, go back to, especially the early 2000s after WCW died. And people would say like, okay, what is the next big thing in wrestling? And everyone would look at the United States demographics and they would say, ah, the, you know, Hispanic market, that's the fastest growing de demographic in the United States. That means Lucha Libre is the best, you know, best situated to capitalize and become big in the United States because the United States is, has so many, you know, Spanish speakers and people coming from, you know, Mexican American populations, especially um, in the border states uh, in the Southwest. Uh, and so everyone just, there was this big group thought that like Lucho was going to become big in the United States because of how many Hispanics there were and, uh, you know, there being space for, for another wrestling company with WCW going down. And that never materialized. Um, Lucha, you know, has, has struggled to expand in the United States. And even when it does do well in the United States, it's almost like in its own little vacuum. It doesn't resonate with the rest of the country. Um, and this has to do with kind of like the way our American culture often segregates um, like non-English speaking uh, cultural phenomenon. Like nobody in television, you know, nobody talks about like Spanish language television, like shows on Telemundo and things like that, even though they might be huge and well-watched shows and the ratings, the Nielsen ratings suggest that there are. Nobody uh, talks about that, right? Nobody in in on um, like ESPN or American, you know, pick your favorite, you know, sports website or things like that. Nobody is covering Liga MX, you know, soccer games, even though Liga MX is, I believe, the most watched soccer league in the United States, much more than MLS or or um, you know the English Premier League or Champions League or anything like that. But because it's segregated in this you know, Spanish speaking market, it doesn't really cross over into the mainstream. And I think Lucha has struggled to do that as well, because even in wrestling terms, there will be like a Lucha Libre show in Laredo, Texas, that might draw 3,500 people as an independent show because it's featuring, you know, I don't know, maybe like Volador Jr. And, you know, uh, Atlantis or um, Pagano or, or or maybe some older AAA wrestlers or, or whoever are appearing on these shows. La Parca are appearing on these shows. And if it was a non-Lucha company and it was in New York City and they drew 3,500 people to an independent show, everyone would be talking about it. Um, but because it's Lucha and it's kind of disconnected from the English-speaking wrestling audience, it just kind of goes under the radar. And so I think that's part of the problem with Lucha in the United States, I think it's part of the reason, one of the reasons that we've never really seen them be able to make huge in-grounds lately. Um, because even if they do draw well, it doesn't seem to pick up any buds outside of the Spanish speaking market, which is too bad, obviously. But I think that's just part of our culture uh, for, for, you know, that's just the reality. Um, but good question. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go on a tangent about our segregated uh, pop culture in the United States, but I just did. Um, this is a similar question. Prince in the Discord, he asks, is there room for third major American TV wrestling product 
or is the market already full of WWE and AEW branded content? If yes, would the third major brand be WWE and AEW adjacent like NXT or ROH, or could a true third brand like Impact or MLW succeed in this? So obviously very similar to my other answer. Um, I don't see a demand for a third company at this moment. I think that in general, WWE is satisfying their fan base and AEW is satisfying their fan base. And there's not a huge group of disgruntled wrestling fans that are going to be able to make a difference in viewership numbers or attendance numbers if a third brand were to emerge to cater towards them. I would argue that a company like NXT, if you're considering them as like an adjacent third American TV wrestling product, would count as a major success. If you look at the television ratings, they've been you know, pretty close to top five uh, on Tuesday nights. Uh, they are, you know, for their for their pay per view events. You know, I think they're going to draw probably around five thousand fans to um, the event uh, this Saturday in Bakersfield, California. So I would consider them a success. But to talk about like another brand, I just I think the market's too saturated. I mean, even look at people talked about this a lot when AEW. Um, first debuted because it's like well if AEW can start could another company like AEW start if another rich guy wanted to get involved and I've always been dubious of that um, I don't think there's first of all I don't think there's available talent to kind of anchor a third brand behind you look at who are like the available free agents even if you were to to sign all of the best available free agents like you were able to get Edge and Dolph Ziggler um, and some of these other people I don't think that's enough to, to launch another major TV wrestling. I think what Impact and MLW are doing or NWA are doing is probably what you would see from another player if they wanted to get involved. Um, and it's just the market's really saturated. I mean, look at since AEW has debuted, uh, they've added you know three more hours of television each week and they're adding more pay-per-views. And so if you are a wrestling fan, and whether you like WWE or you like AEW, and if you like both, you're watching a lot of wrestling just to keep up with those companies. So I just don't see a major market for, um, I don't just don't see a major market for another brand. I mean, even if like a really wealthy entity wanted to start uh, a third wrestling company, like they could maybe raid AEW and WWE's roster. Um, but those companies are so financially powerful that it would be it'd be very expensive, and I just don't see the demand for another TV wrestling product. Um, certainly, um, we'll see. You know, with the TV deals, um, the, with the TV deals coming up, like if there's a lot more interest in WWE and AEW from all these different TV networks, that may provide some some insight. There's another question. Uh, in this mailbag, I'll get to towards the end that I'll kind of elaborate on. But I do think the T, like what kind of bidders and bids we see for these TV deals might imply that there perhaps is some interest in other television networks in pro wrestling. And if that is the case, that maybe provides an opportunity for another wrestling company to kind of take off if they can get a strong television outlet. Um, moving on, uh, CSW14 asks, you could only watch one wrestling company for the next five years. Which one are you watching? Um, if I could only watch one for the next five years, I think it would have to be AEW um, for a number of reasons. Um, if you were to ask, like, what product do I enjoy more, like AEW or New Japan Pro Wrestling, because those would be the two I'd really be picking from. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know which one I like more. Like, I probably like AEW more as just an overall more interesting product because it's an English speak, primarily English speaking product. And it's a more fascinating company to watch because it's not, unlike New Japan, it's not an institution. It's kind of constantly having to evolve and it's growing and it's, it's just a kind of a much more fascinating company to follow, not just watch wrestling matches and because it was just watching wrestling matches it'd probably be new japan but as far as like being able to watch and follow a company um it it's probably going to be AEW. i think 
like for me personally, what I'm doing, like the kind of analysis that I provide and certainly through WrestleNomics as well, AEW is just the most important company to watch for what I'm particularly doing um, in this space. Like it's way more, I think it's just, it's way cl- more interesting to like follow AEW's business and to kind of look at the direction of the product for me. Um, it's not just, to me, this question is not just about like what matches are going to be better. What, what, what company are you going to like, if you could, had to watch a two hour show, which company would you prefer to me? I can't really answer that necessarily. I, I focus more on like, what is following wrestling and watching wrestling actually mean for me and it's a lot of it is covering it a lot of it is discussing it analyzing it looking at business metrics all those things so i'm gonna go with aw i also think when when aw really hits it's the funnest promotion to kind of talk about and follow and see what other people think and a lot of that is just more people watch aw than new japan in in you know my circles you know when when there's a great new japan show i know i can talk about it with people who who really closely follow New Japan. And when there's a great AEW show, I can just talk about it with more people. The product is more accessible for your typical American wrestling fan because it's on US TV. And so that was like one of the cool things about when AEW first started is that when AEW had like a killer show, like, you know, if you go back to Double or Nothing and like, if I want to talk about like that Cody Rhodes versus Dustin Rhodes match, um, I can just talk about it like with a lot more people than I could talk about like, you know, Okada versus Omega, even though there are plenty of people to talk about it with. It was kind of all in the hardcore New Japan fan bubble because those are the people that were really watching the show. Um, AEW is just a, a greater diversity of people watching it. So it's more fun to kind of be, you know, when the promotion really hits to to to, to, to fire up and, and talk about it with so many other people. That's really not a, I, I don't want to knock New Japan it, but I think it's just a symptom of being like an American company and I'm an American. And um, that's just, it's more fun that that way, even though obviously I really like New Japan and I would be very sad in this hypothetical scenario if I had to watch one wrestling company for the next five years and I couldn't watch New Japan anymore. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name, so I apologize, but this is from the Discord, I believe. And it's K Shu. K Shu. That's what I'm going to guess. Maybe Cashew? Is that how it's supposed to be? Anyway, they ask, I believe that a lot of AEW's perceived drop in quality and move to a different presentation of wrestling can be linked back to the rankings being dropped. That small change stole balls. It led to challengers for titles seemingly coming out of the blue and less structure in matches losing a subtle purpose. That subtle purpose being winning moves you up. Even with the more sport entertainment style booking or storylines, when the rankings were in effect, you had the idea that a win could move someone up and a loss could move someone down without preserve with preserving some structure of reality. So I hear this like a lot of people, um, you know, are are, wish the rankings didn't go away and and want them to come back. Uh, I I personally think that. I think a lot of people have a romantic view of the rankings. Um, they were never really taken that seriously within AEW. Um, they were there. They showed them on screen. The announcers would talk about them, but they never really were like the end all be all to how programs were developed and how title challenges, how title challengers were um, chosen. Like, Challengers came out of the blue all the time. Wrestlers would call each other out. They would be in a feud. Whatever reason would happen it wasn't always the person who was number one in the rankings would get a title shot. Um, And someone that was like undefeated wouldn't even be in the rankings. There was a lot of internal inconsistencies when the rankings were around. So I don't necessarily think that if there have been changes to AEW's booking and presentation, that it's because the rankings helped keep everyone on track and focused in a way that no longer exists. I, I don't think the rankings really accomplish a lot other than being a graphic on the screen and kind of maybe keeping in mind for some fans that like oh these wrestlers if you win you go up in the rankings and if you lose you go down so this match is now important 
you know, AEW didn't really have a lot of matches that were like these two people are number three and number four in the rankings and they're going to wrestle. And it's not like a number one contenders match, but it will make a big difference if the person wins. AEW never really presented matches like that. Their matches were always based around some sort of feud or storyline. It could be something as minor as someone, you know, interrupting someone mid promo or someone doing a, a random backstage beatdown or something like that, or being on opposite sides of a, two warring groups and things like that. I never really saw like a lot of like ranking space matches. I, I understand what, Kishu here is asking um, that I think in a perfect world, you could use the rankings in a lot of ways to have those type, types of matches without needing to have, you know, gigantic storyline explanations and having a rankings forced the bookers to, you know, Tony Khan to be more honest and consistent. Um, but I just don't think that ever happens in AEW in the first place. Um, so I don't necessarily think the rankings going away change that i just think that aw was kind of always like that and the rankings going away maybe it was like a formal split to not even acknowledging the idea of rankings and i think i think a lot of times people would complain about the rankings and they would say like you know oh how come this person's not ranked higher in the rankings they're undefeated or how come this person is you know not getting a title shot they're number one in the rankings and i think having the rankings was uh something that tony khan and aw eventually viewed as being unnecessary and kind of getting in the way of the other creative direction which i'm not saying is a good thing it maybe makes more sense to have the rankings there to keep you honest but it goes to show like i don't think the rankings were ever taken that seriously by aw in the first place so i don't really think them going away uh really changed anything um but theoretically it could could uh, could you bring them back and, and make them you know mean more yes you could do that um and maybe that would help uh clarify aspects of the product that you feel like are lacking i could see that um adam berger who is a two-time guest on this show he asks sonata a great iwgp world heavyweight champion or the greatest iwgp world heavyweight champion i'm going to uh take this as as adam asking uh what I think about Sonata as champion. And the answer is, I don't really think he's any different than he was before. And the issue with him being IWGP World Heavyweight Champion is the history of that title is really centered around tippity-tippity-top guys. It's Okada's title. It's Tanahashi's title. It's Kenny Omega's title. It's Naito's title. It's Nakamura, you know, well, Nakamura wasn't really a great IWGP heavyweight champion, but, you know, even someone like AJ Styles or Jay White, it was the title to have. And, and you have to be a tippy top guy to have that. And Sonata's not. He's just not. He doesn't have the charisma and the consistency um, and that next level as in ring performer to be comparable to most of their former champions and i try to say that that's not it's not as a very talented pro wrestler but when we're talking about this is the title that okada has this is the title that naito tanahashi omega will osprey this is the title that they have we're talking about the most talented wrestlers of the last 15 and 20 years so that's the standard you have to hit if you're getting this world title and you're getting a serious run with it. Um, and if you don't hit that standard, which is an incredibly high standard, really the highest standard that we have in pro wrestling, um, you're going to come across as a second rate champion. And I think that's the case for Sonata. I think that everyone is just kind of waiting for one of those real tip top guys to come in and, um, and take the title off of Sonata. And I said, I like Sonata. I think he's had some good matches. Um, I, I, you know, I think that it was worth roll. I, I think for New Japan's perspective, it was worth rolling the dice with him. It was worth being like, all right, we have to see if we can actually make this guy a top guy. And the only way to see for sure is to actually try. And this is a sincere attempt to do that. So I have uh, no problems with Gato in, in, in New Japan doing that, but I think we're, what we're seeing from that experiment is that he isn't that guy. 
Um, and even though the repackaging of him a little bit and giving him his own little stable and things like that uh, has helped him kind of stand out. But to me, he's going to come across as kind of like a transitional champion. And I, I'm pretty confident Naito is going to win at Wrestle Kingdom. And I don't know if I would give Sonata the championship again uh, after the way this title run has gone. It kind of reminds me of Jake Lee and Noah in the sense of Jake Lee has a lot of similarities to Sonata where he checks a lot of boxes when you think about who do you want as a world champion, you know, good look, good size, um, capable wrestler in the ring. Um, let's give them a little new gimmick. Let's see if we can make them the world champion. Uh, and it hasn't worked for Jake Lee. And it hasn't worked for Sonata. For Noah, it makes almost more sense because there's just a le way less um, guys you really can put the GHC title on. And, and um, it's not as risky, I guess, because you're you're looking at mostly people over the age of 40 that would be considered like proper champions. So it makes sense to put the title on a guy like Jake Lee, just like it did make sense to put the title on a guy like Sonata. But I think he's just not at the level that New Japan has traditionally uh, had for that title and he's probably going to be taken off of him uh, at some point uh user the world need a fucking rebel asks is yoda shuji a guy or the guy yoda suji is the guy and when i talk about the level that new japan has for that world championship and who can be the top guy I look at Yoda Suji and I say, that guy is the top guy. That is the guy you want to push to the top. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a slam dunk because there are no slam dunks in pro wrestling. But as far as a young guy uh, who has had a, a limited amount of time to be showcased at the highest level, and you look at what he does well and what kind of benchmarks he needs to hit. I think he's hit all of them. Uh, he's obviously coming off that tremendous match with Will Ospreay um, from Destruction and Kobe from this past weekend. He is uh, coming off a very strong G1. He checks all of the boxes I think of when I think of what a good champion and future you know, main event top guy is. He's got good size. He's very charismatic. He's very charismatic in the ring. He's got such an expressive face. He is extremely athletic. He does cool moves. Uh, I think the fans credibly believe that he's an ass kicker. Um, he is uh, a blue chip A plus prospect. And when I think of, he's the first guy New Japan has kind of developed uh, themselves where I think of like, you know, when, when Okada needs to be phased down, when Naito is phased down, this is a guy, the domestic wrestler, that is going to take, that has everything you want to kind of hold up that legacy that those stars have had, which is very difficult to find. I like Shuda Omino. Um, I think he's been pretty promising, but Yoda Suji's at like a different level in terms of how ready he is now. And... You know, he's not super young. It's not like he's 21 years old. I think he's close. To, I think he's like 30. I'm going to look it up now. Um, yeah, he's 30 years old. So he's not like super duper young. So I wouldn't spend forever. Uh, you know, I don't think he needs to go on a five-year journey before becoming world champion. I, I would I would not surprise me at all if he's the world champion next year at some time in 2024. Um, I'm a huge Yoda Suji fan. I've been blown away with his performance since he came back from CMLL. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think he's, he's been tremendous and I, I would definitely consider him to be, it would be very surprising to me if he was not considered by pretty much everyone that watches a variety of pro wrestling to be one of like the five best pro wrestlers in the world in like three or four years. I just think he's, he's going, to, he's on that trajectory right now. Uh, Chris Bork on Twitter, he asks, who is your leading candidate for Booker of the Year and why? Um, I thought a lot about this question. And I think to me, the Booker that uh, I think satisfies the criteria best is going to be um, Chavo Luderov of CMLL. 
Uh, I think the candidates for me personally are Chabu Uderoff, uh Gato in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and uh, Tony Khan for AEW. And I think to kind of talk about their strengths and weaknesses, for me, I enjoy, I have enjoyed Tony's output creatively. Um, probably hasn't been as strong as it has been in past years, but I still think it's pretty good. I still think AEW does a really good job for the most part, presenting a product that's interesting, compelling, and having creative ideas that have led to some really good segments and good matches and strong pay-per-views and things like that. Cool moments, all of that stuff. Um, but it's hard to say, you know, AEW's business performance in 2023, you could definitely poke a lot of holes in that. Um, has maybe not been as strong as some people would have expected it to be. Um, and the booking hasn't been as strong as either. Um, so I think he's just got a little bit too much going against him. Uh, you know, Gato, I think, has taken a lot of good risks this year. Um, with New Japan, they've been really focused on elevating new talent. I just talked about Yoda Suji and how he's been presented. You know, you've got Shota Minu, you've got Ren Narita, um, you've got some other talent that you're kind of working on, David Finlay being elevated up a little bit. Uh, so I think that um, they're, New Japan's kind of in a rebuilding phase, and I think that's going pretty well. Uh, it's obviously not a peak New Japan year in terms of of business, and obviously there's other impacts of that, like the pandemic and um you know, the wrestling market in Japan and, and just various different variables that are probably out of Gato's control. But I, I think Gato, like next year, is going to reap a lot of the rewards that he's setting up this year. And so you could argue that putting your company in a strong position to succeed in 2024 is a huge goal of any booker in 2023. So I, he's a very strong candidate, but I just don't think at the business end, um, he's holding up his end of the bar. Uh, he, he, I don't say he's not holding up his end of the bargain, but he's not... Um, at the same level uh, that maybe you look for in terms of Booker of the Year. And then so that leaves Chavo Luderoff, who I think is satisfying most of the criteria in terms of CMLL's business is way up. Um, they're also kind of like Japan recovering from the pandemic in a different way. Um, they're so reliant on on live attendance and especially tourism. That was obviously down for the years coming off the pandemic, but that's creeping back up to normalcy uh, in Mexico so they're seeing a, a boost there, but also just CMLL's booking has has really improved uh, over the last year. They have successfully elevated some different wrestlers to the picture. They've gotten Bastico back up and running at his highest level, but you also see people like, you know, the new Mascara Dorada, who's really taking off as, as a youngster, only I think 21 years old. Um, the push of someone like Atlantis Jr. continues to, to make steady progress. And you're just seeing, I think, a product that is taking off business-wise. Their attendance is much stronger than it was last year. And the shows have a really high-quality performance. And following the death of Paco Alonso, um, this promotion was a mess. There was a huge power struggle. You had top wrestlers leaving left and right. Um, there was a lot of pettiness involved. It was just a com – and then the, you throw in the pandemic, and it was just a complete and utter mess. And, you know, Chavo Luderoff, who – my understanding is that he's like the key creative guy behind CMLL. I'm sure other people can can elaborate a lot further on what his specific role is in this, but he's really stepped up and they've evolved their booking. They've been, uh, I don't want to say like less traditional, but they've really kind of taken a look at their roster and said, we got to get younger. We got to see who are some young people we can elevate um, while also doing a good job focusing on your established stars. Obviously, you know, Mystico is back up to like close to his drawing peak. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, you still have people like Volador Jr. and Ultimo Guerrero uh, still being, you know, pushed pretty prominently, but you also have the younger guys stepping up too. I just think CMLL from a booking perspective is the most well-booked tight promotion of 2023. And he's probably not going to win this award. I feel like Triple H is probably going to win the best booker of the year award in the wrestling I'm doing newsletter. Um, but I, if I just look at what criteria I'm looking for, I think, Chavo Luderoth and, and CMLL really checks all of the boxes. So that would be my choice. Uh, Connor from the Discord, and I should clarify that this is Northern Ireland Connor, yellow Connor, uh, not to be confused with gray Republic of Ireland Connor. But Northern Ireland Connor asks, 
do you think there is a potential issue with prospects under 30 in American wrestling? A lot of the top stars in both AEW and WWE over the last decade are products of the indie explosion of the 2000s. But now that scene no longer exists. Do you think that we will possibly see some negative consequences of this a few years down the line as both AEW and WWE have at best a spotty track record of producing their own wrestlers from scratch? This was a question I was more concerned about like a few years ago. Um where I was really um, concerned that all of the true difference-making stars in pro wrestling, the people that really could pop a rating or sell pay-per-views um, or anything like that, that all of those people had been created 15 or more years ago and wrestling had lost its mass appeal and our pop culture had become more scattered in general, that that singular drawing card didn't exist anymore. And a lot of it was like, CM Punk came into AEW and just set all of their business records. The 215,000 pay-per-view buys, the massive rating for Rampage when he first debuted, the instant sellout at the United Center. And obviously those were high watermarks for AEW, but a lot of it was me thinking like, okay, as... As much as I like Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks uh, and these other guys, CM Punk just has way more star power because he comes from a different era where wrestling was more popular and people hadn't seen him in a while. And it made me think, like, is wrestling done producing wrestlers that can do maybe not that great business, but can, can really have an individual impact on drawing? Uh, and he looked at you know, how much of a failure Roman Reigns was for most of his, his main event run in terms of being a singular drawing card. And that was with so many resources dedicated towards him. And I just kind of became pessimistic about is wrestling, can it produce real top stars anymore? Um, or is just the business is, is stuck with just their existing audience and there's no individual stars that will come and emerge to feel big enough to really make a difference business wise. And I think over the last year or so, there has been some evidence to suggest that uh, that's not the case. We've seen, you know, the Reigns and Bloodline stuff really did take off and did start making that kind of big difference that hadn't been there for most of Reigns' career. Uh, look at how big of a star Cody Rhodes was when he jumped to WWE and how good he did for, for Raw quarter hours and how... Uh, big of a singular drawing power card he f he he has felt and you look at like mjf's quarter hours and in, in aw and how he seems to be growing into a a drawing card at that in that way uh and i think okay we're starting to see this next generation of wrestlers and maybe some of them are, are, are to have taken a little bit too long certainly most people would probably say that about roman reigns um to get there but they did get there and now we're not we're no, we're no longer entirely reliant on wrestlers from the past, whether it's CM Punk, whether it's John Cena, whether it's Bill Goldberg or The Undertaker. We're not reliant on those stars coming back to pop or, or rating into pop business. Something can be done with the wrestlers that we do have to make them feel like a big deal and they can they can hit it big. Now, in terms of talent development, I understand what Connor is asking in the sense of WWE's track record in the Performance Center is not good in terms of being able to develop their own talents. Uh, AEW, we really haven't seen them try to develop that much of their own talents. They're, you know, mostly reliant on picking talent off the indies. That's certainly the foundation of the company. But, uh, and so like you think about, okay, well, the indies, there's no ring of honor that's going to have a wrestler for 10 years on the indies or wrestlers staying on the indies for years and years and years and getting to wrestle all these great opponents and be able to, to, to develop and, and turn into, you know, your next Seth Rollins or your next John Moxley or your next Kevin Owens or, you know, your next um, Adam Cole or any of these people, right? Uh, because the Indies are different. They're not developing talent at the same rate. I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really think that's an issue. I think if you have somebody who is really talented and they want to make it as a pro wrestler, um, they will be able to do that on the indies as they are currently constructed. Um, I think MJF is a good example in terms of 
MJF was not a huge indie wrestler. He wasn't in Ring of Honor for five years. He wasn't working against all these great indie guys for years and years and years, and then finally got a chance in AEW. He had only been wrestling for a few years, and it was mostly in like his local indie scene. And I know he did stuff with MLW, but he really wasn't this um, guy who was in Evolve every other weekend or Ring of Honor or going out to PWG and, and, and doing all this stuff. He was mainly came up in an indie wrestling environment that was pretty similar to what exists now. But he's really talented, and he really wanted to make it as a pro wrestler. And he's turned into a significant star in AEW. Uh, and I think you'll continue to find those people. Um, it's maybe they won't get quite as good as, as, um, as, and they won't be maybe as ready as the guys from the previous era were. But... The guys in the previous era were so ready because wrestling was incompetent and that, you know, decision makers in WWE and decision makers in Impact weren't signing these guys, even though they were really, really good. And like, there's no reason for Kevin Owens to have been in Ring of Honor for 10 years. Uh, it was foolish for the companies to not bring him in much quicker than that. And we've seen that philosophy change. WWE is signing, you know, has signed a lot of indie guys, uh, you know, with with limited experience and AW certainly as well. And I guess the onus will come on, not on producing their own talent, but being able to train that talent up to up to a high standard. For WWE, I just don't believe in the Performance Center. I just don't think the Performance Center uh, is going to churn out a lot of top talent. Um, maybe that's unnecessary for WWE's business model. But as far as like, I don't believe in the Performance Center, but I don't think you have to. I think if WWE is, even if it's poaching AEW talent, um, or, or signing some of their own indie talent or, or getting talent from, you know, internationally like Dragon Lee, uh, it makes a big difference. Um, and I think that uh, AEW, you know, I think about like a wrestler like Nick Wayne, who seems to have a lot of potential, um, already has a few years of experience, but he's, you know, came up through this indie scene, not the indie scene from 10 years ago. Uh you know, it, it will come down to, you know, how is he able to develop in, in AEW? Is he able to to mature at the rate? I mean, he's only 18 years old. There's so much that can happen between now and when he, you know, should be hitting his peak as a pro wrestler. But I'm not that concerned that there's going to be like a shortage of talent because I think at the highest level, the talent um, that is going to stand out will, conti will continue to stand out. And the people that are you know, fit to be top stars at the highest level will continue to be found. Um, might be a little bit more difficult, might be a little bit more um, lower profile. You might have to take sign a guy earlier in his career than you would have, you know, 10 years ago. But those are ultimately healthy things for the industry. It's, it's probably realistically better for a Nick Wayne to be signed by AEW and work regularly and work against, you know, Christian Cage in, in, you know, Shane Strickland or um, these, you know, really, really talented guys than it would be for him to be working against not particularly good wrestlers on a consistent basis on the indie level. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's too soon, I think, to really look at AEW's talent development and see if they're a success or failure, just because we haven't, we don't have that many data points um, to reference. Um, WWE, I'm obviously, we have a lot more and I'm not that confident, but even then I don't consider it that a huge problem. Um, uh, NC Kyle again, he asks, here's a theory I have. Uh, if you want to tear it apart or yes, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, the following things are true. Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor and preserving its history is a good thing all around. Number two, this is a serious justified criticism around, there is a serious justified criticism around how it's presented, like AEW Dark or Dark Elevation, and that it's completely skippable in any important matches that take place on AEW programming. My theory is it would be better for Ring of Honor if Tony Khan owned the library and not the current product. I propose that TK presenting, managing, and running both Ring of Honor and AEW devalues modern Ring of Honor, especially as it is presented currently. Again, Tony owning the library is great for wrestling. My theory is that Ring of Honor under different ownership is a much different animal, much more watchable and exciting. They don't have anything to prove when they're already owned by Tony Khan. I think it makes sense that uh, in terms of like 
Ring of Honor is clearly not a priority for Tony Khan. It has not had strong attention to its booking. There's not been a lot of dedicated big matches presented in Ring of Honor, certainly not on the Ring of Honor weekly television. Um, the pay-per-views have done fairly well and are been relatively interesting and had some great matches since Tony Khan has taken over management. But he is... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very skippable. It's it's not exciting. It doesn't get any buzz. Um, would it be better if Tony Khan didn't run it? Um, I don't know about that because who else is running it if it's not Tony Khan? And even though you can say like, well, all the big matches and, and big things are given away on AW television, not Ring of Honor television. Um, so something like Eddie Kingston winning the Ring of Honor title was done on a W event, not a Ring of Honor event. Uh, that you know the affiliation with AEW and having those titles on on AEW wrestlers and being on AEW television still creates much more buzz for Ring of Honor than I think would have existed otherwise. Because if you if Ring of Honor is owned by a non Tony Khan entity, who is owning it, and what are they able to accomplish with the Ring of Honor brands? Uh, at that's at this stage of its existence i mean would it be uh more watchable and exciting i don't know was um ring of honor before tony khan bought it like kind of when it was in its uh you know dying days under uh sinclair was was that uh that much more watchable and exciting uh i don't know i mean i guess it, more stuff happened and you could say it was more exciting because you had to watch ring of honor as opposed to just watching aw to kind of see the major stuff but I didn't think there was any buzz around that promotion. Um, they couldn't draw. They couldn't uh, sell pay-per-views. And if if someone else bought it, like I feel like it would be like almost like the NWA or something like that. This this old brand that has lost its buzz and isn't exciting anymore. Um, all I can say is that yeah, the major matches would probably happen on Ring of Honor, which would probably help the TV show to an extent. But it also wouldn't have nearly the amount of roster resources that. AEW has been able to have. You wouldn't have a wrestler like Claudio Castagnoli as champion. You certainly wouldn't have Athena as a women's champion. Um, MJF and Adam Cole wouldn't be tag champions. Like you wouldn't have nearly the amount of star power that Ring of, Ring of Honor currently has. Um, so like if there was a hypothetical billionaire out there that bought Ring of Honor instead of Tony Khan and wanted to donate, dedicate a lot of resources to signing top talents and like run ring of honor as a dedicated you know third major wrestling company then yeah it would be better but i just don't see a scenario where that really exists i think even though ring of honor has been a disappointment under tony khan it's still hard for me to believe that tony khan there's a bet there is to be realistically a better buyer out there uh for ring of honor that would be willing to do more with it because if uh you know, if Sinclair wasn't going to keep it, the company was going to shut down. The company did shut down um, under Sinclair. So if Tony Khan was in, like WWE maybe buys it, but I don't think WWE runs Ring of Honor. That doesn't really make any sense for them. I just I just don't see a realistic scenario where uh, Ring of Honor is like saved and is running really strongly. Um, I don't see the buyer out there. And I, you know, hypothetically, yes, would it be better if, if, Someone else bought it and was really dedicated to, to pre presenting a compelling weekly television program. Yes, but I just don't know if that person exists. Tail Avery asks, in honor of fall, what are your favorite things about fall in New England? What a great question, Tail. Um, what are my favorite things about fall in New England? I mean, not to be cliche, but I mean, you got to put over the foliage, right? The foliage in New England is spectacular. In the fall time, I uh, I went to college in the Ber in the Berkshires out in Western Massachusetts. I went to Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams, Massachusetts, and it's like a um, it's like a, a you know a greeting card or a postcard. Like the the foliage up in the mountains is really spectacular. Obviously, if you go up New Hampshire or, or Vermont or Maine, you see a similar kind of vibe. It, it's one of those things that you don't appreciate as a kid, and you don't understand why people talk about like the leaves turning. Uh, when you're like five or six years old but as you become an adult uh, like the wonders of nature become more compelling and you really like I, when I was in college like it was like a joke like you would take it for granted but you would just look up at the mountainside and just see this wave of of golden brown and yellows and reds and it was just really picturesque 
Um, and I usually make a trip out there um, once a year in the fall. I don't know if I'm going to make it this year, um, but I will try to go out in October, November. But I mean, going up to New Hampshire, you know, the leaves have already changed in North New England at the higher elevations. Uh, here where I am in the Boston area, I don't see a ton of color. I think there's a tree outside my window right now that looks like it's starting to turn a little bit red, but it'll be a few more weeks before we really see it. But foliage is top class. Um, if, if you're from an area that doesn't really have strong foliage, I recommend a trip to New England. And, you know, the if you want to come to, to Boston, I would recommend like an October um time to see really the colors and 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 go out and, and drive through like kind of the more rural areas because it's really a spectacular view um if you don't like it uh other stuff that i like about fall in new england um get, get getting that nice pumpkin flavored stuff that pump pumpkin muffin from dunks you know my you know it's really about my sunday sundays in the fall fucking rule okay um perfect sunday for me is this and this pretty much happened this is my sunday routine at this point Wake up, wake up around 9 a.m. ish. Uh, go out, take a nice, you know, if it's a nice day out and you got that nice crisp fall weather air, you know, it's maybe in the high 50s, low 60s, partly cloudy or sunny. Put on a nice sweater. I usually walk, you know, about uh, a half mile to to one of the four Dunkin' Donuts that were at an easy walking distance of my house. Get that pumpkin muffin from Dunks. Bring it back to my house. Maybe if it's really nice outside, I sit in, sit in the front porch, uh, you know, pop open the sports page. I forgot the globe on me. Sometimes I do the immaculate grids in the morning at that time period. You know, enjoy my pumpkin muffin. Come back inside, get ready for some WrestleNomics. Post WrestleNomics. Once WrestleNomics wraps up, it's football time. Usually drive over to my parents' house, watch the Pats with my dad. Uh, it's just the best. I love that aspect of fall. It's probably, fall is probably my favorite season. Not necessarily because of weather, but just because everything kind of lines up for those just chill Sundays. It's, it's, it's the absolute best. And it's not necessarily, I guess, uh, necessary for new England. Uh, I'm sure you can be in other parts of the country and enjoy basically the exact same thing, but just for me and my routine, it's just, it's just picturesque. Um, the nice weather, the foliage, pumpkin flavored stuff, apple cider stuff, apple cider donuts, shout out honey pot farms in Stowe, Massachusetts. Um, Playing some fall golf. I always try to get in a few rounds during the, the, the fall season again with an excellent foliage. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Newton Commonwealth Golf Course. People have played there, which I'd be surprised if any listener has, has played a Newton Commonwealth Golf Course. But if they have, shout out. Um, but yeah, just 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 all of that. Uh, part of my favorite aspects of the fall. Um, you know, Halloween season, you can do... Uh, People can go up to Salem, Mass, which has probably the most expansive Halloween, you know, tourism industry and, and I don't know, probably the country. Uh, that That's almost like a tourist trap. It's kind of like a madhouse. I wouldn't necessarily go there, um, but that's another aspect of the fall you can do. Uh, then, you know, Thanksgiving comes. Same thing happens. Thanksgiving weather, eating that good food. Uh but yeah, those are those are some of the things uh, of my favorite things about fall in New England. Uh, thank you for the question, Tail. Uh, Joe Gagne asks, "What is the realistic best case and worst case scenario for U.S. wrestling in five years? Will wrestling ever be as unpopular as it was in the early '90s?" Um, I, you know, it's really hard for me to believe that wrestling will ever be as unpopular as it was in the early '90s. Um, when you look at what you know. Like, you know, 1993, 1994, what WCW was doing and what WWF was doing. Um, the business is just so different. Uh, the, the the television revenue is obviously in the, in the, in the, the, the kind of the security the television revenue provides. Um, you have now two top companies that are just extremely well-funded and financially secure. WWE obviously has their you know, billion dollar television deals. AEW will probably get very healthy television increases um, when this new deal gets done. Plus they have the backing of an extremely wealthy person in Tony Khan. And, you know, you couldn't really say that back then in, in the early nineties, obviously, you know, WCW had its issues and WWF, they didn't have the same kind of financial security um, that either, you know, w, uh, WWE or AEW has now. Um, so I, I, and, and the business just isn't as volatile as it used to be. Um, 
in the in the 90s you're talking about you're still getting a wave of fans that came up as fans during the territory era um and it's just like you'd have you know you'd bring in a top star business would pop huge something would happen that star leaves or or an angle fails or someone flops as champion or whatever and business just goes way down we, we don't see that fluctuation in wrestling business anymore we haven't seen it in quite a long time um Business doesn't go way up and way down all the time based on one angle or one wrestler. It's just it's a bunch of little things that contribute towards success and failure. And it usually happens over a long period of time, not just one year and two year. Um, maybe in five years, the business is totally in the tank. But I find that kind of hard to believe. I mean, even AEW, who hasn't been around for that long, seems to have found a really consistent fan base that watches no matter what. Um, we see it with their television ratings being very stable and stable in a good way in terms of basically being in the top five every week for dynamite. Um, and even like the rampage and collision ratings have been relatively stable. You could say maybe they're a little bit disappointing, but they're certainly stable and able to, uh, be competitive enough to maintain their TV slots. Um, and obviously Ron Smackdown and NXT have been up for the most part, uh, over the last year. So I just, I don't see... The business fluctuating that much and then you got lifelong wrestling fans that are going to keep watching um i don't think from fi five years is long enough for like the fundamental aspects of the business to change in terms of like tv revenue suddenly drying up um wwe obviously just signed a billion dollar deal for smackdown uh for the next five years that starts next year so they're going to be secure raw will probably sign a similar deal and AEW will probably sign a deal not as lucrative but in similar term in terms of length um, so I think in five years, that's still going to be, these, these are still companies that are going to make absurd amounts of money off television revenue. Um, is general wrestling popularity that, that may be waning as our culture diversifies, maybe harder to kind of, uh, get a mass appeal back in pro wrestling. Um, I guess like the best case scenario would be AEW getting really, really hot, like way hotter than they are now. and other wealthy investors or other um, television or streaming entities saying, well, these guys were able to break into the wrestling market and look how much money they're making now. What if we broke in and did and, and, um, and were able to, to start our own wrestling company? It might not go well, um, but that's how AW started. I mean, Tony Khan was a really wealthy guy who had an interest in pro wrestling and he saw that with the success of New Japan in the United States and Ring of Honor, that there was, you know, stars available and there was room for another pro wrestling company to, to take off in if as long as it was well-funded and it had television connections. And if AEW proves that they can do that um, and they become enviable by uh, other television networks and other investors or rich guys that are looking to make more money, they could put something together and, and make a third company and provide more room for competition, more uh, a di more space for like maybe a different type of product, uh, different talent being pushed. Uh, obviously, wrestlers would get paid more if there was a third bidder now for their services. That's probably the best case scenario for the wrestling industry is just another strong competitor emerging. I, I think that's probably unlikely to happen, but I could see it if if AEW takes off further and shows that that it really can be done uh, even more so than they already have. Um, JMS JMS thirty thirty five asks if you're still oh well that part doesn't need to be in here sorry I'm I'm butchering this question that JMS asked JMS thirty thirty five asks you often talk about the online discourse has there ever been a time where the online discourse has changed your mind or made you rethink your opinion. Assuming not, is there anything beneficial to online discourse? Uh, this is kind of a funny question because I definitely use the term the online discourse and I almost use it as like a synonym for like annoying people online are talking about this. And I understand where he's coming from. Like I have, I don't dislike the online discourse and I think um, all the time the online discourse is vitally important to understanding different perspectives uh, and how you view the product. Um you know, I wouldn't have gotten into a lot of the different aspects of wrestling that I've gone into without the online discourse, without people saying like, hey, you know, you should watch this wrestling. It seems to be really good. Or, you know, this wrestling in WWE is bad. Like very few uh, 
thoughts that any of us have about pro wrestling would be like original thoughts. I think a lot of the times it's someone pointing something out to us and that influencing the way we view or think about something. And so that's why, despite the fact like where we could talk about, oh, Twitter is being a cesspool or the people on Discord are stupid or my Facebook comments or YouTube comments or whatever. Um, as long as, you know, we can knock those all we want. But the truth is um, being able to see other people's opinions on pro wrestling or on anything is vital to our learning process. It's vital to... Uh, understanding how we view things, understanding our perspectives. Um, and, you know, there are kind of two types of wrestling um, criticism. There's personal taste and there's business analysis. There's, we can talk about, this is what I personally like and dislike. And then we can talk about, well, this is good for business and this is bad for business. And the online discourse can, I think, share some insight and in how to, one does not always correspond into the other. Um, like you can believe that, oh, I really like this wrestler. I think they're great. They should be pushed. But then if you realize that their quarter hours do poorly and they're not really, and they're not doing that bad and they're uh, not selling merchandise or whatever, you'd realize, huh, I didn't know, I don't know why people don't like this wrestler. And then you can go online and see an online discourse and see that people have a bunch of problems with that wrestler. And it can kind of make you say, huh, I wouldn't have thought about that if I didn't see other people's opinions. And that can kind of bridge the gap between your personal taste and your ability to analyze the business. Um, I think that like a, an example of this is a lot of people seem to think that MJF is not connecting with, with some fans. And that might be one of the reasons attendance in AEW is lacking. And if you were to just watch AEW Dynamite and you see the fans going crazy for MJF, the fans that are there, you would think, well, MJF is a huge star. The people love him. He's like 1985 Hulk Hogan. Um, but the business analysis would say, well, he's not really drawing like 1985 Hulk Hogan. So what's going on there? And if you were to examine some of the online discourse, you would see plenty of people that have different issues with the way MJF is being presented and not really liking him. And that is all helpful insight. It helps, you know, shape your own perspective, but also helps you understand. And there's plenty of smart people out there that are sharing their opinions and there's plenty of dumb people. And in a lot of cases, the dumb people can be just as insightful as the smart people because it can help you understand the way other people think. Uh, so there's obviously plenty to learn and I'm obviously still active in the online discourse, even if I use it as a euphemism for, for people that I don't like saying things. Um, so it's funny that you asked the question like that, but sure, there's still plenty to be gained by seeing conversations, seeing what other people think. Um, you know, if you disagree with someone, it's often an opportunity to learn uh, about why they think that way. And you can use your own judgment or whether or not it's valuable information that you're gleaning from that disagreement. But it's it's still a uh, a powerful tool in, in helping us with, you know, analyzing pro wrestling and understanding the business um, and understanding different fans. Uh, Avengers 23, he asks, what reasons for optimism about the state of wrestling media, especially as the old guard start getting older are there so you're at, he's asking basically like as you know your dave Meltzer and wade kellers get older you know what what is what kind of optimism do we have for pro wrestling media um you know this operates on the assumption that like we still love dave and you know the torch gets a lot of things right mike johnson gets things right and this new wave of pro wrestling media which is all just a bunch of fans with blogs uh are bad um and it's more nuanced than that um but for terms of optimism, I would say uh, two things. The first is that fans are way more aware of wrestling news than they were 20 years ago. Um, it's a much bigger business. There's a lot more people getting involved. And you could argue that media literacy is worse than it was 20 or 30 years ago. But the truth is a lot more people are critical of wrestling media than they were 20 or 30 years ago because a lot more people are paying attention to it. And that's a good thing. It's good that we have people that you know care about this and care about wrestling media conversations and those kind of things because that's that's something I don't think really existed I wasn't around 30 years ago but it, I can't imagine it's you know people care about it way more than they did five or six years ago so I imagine it was much more dramatic than it was like in the 90s um 
So I think that there's, you know, fans are, 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 are willing to not only want wrestling news, but they want good wrestling news and they will call out wrestling news sites when they don't think they're going to doing a good job. And you could say, well, a lot of times those people are wrong because they don't know what they're talking about and they don't know anything about journalism, but it's still a, a positive that people are willing to focus on wrestling news. And there's a real, as you know, I've discovered myself, there's a real appetite for, you know, discussing wrestling media and practices and a focus on that. Um, the, uh, the wrestling companies themselves are more open to news. Certainly, the idea of you know a WWE executive having a press conference and taking questions from wrestling news outlets, you know, as 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 poor as a lot of those questions may be, never existed even a few years ago. It would seem insane for that to happen. But between AEW and WWE, we now have that almost on a on a monthly basis. So those are really positive steps in terms of transparency. It's positive steps in terms of getting more people connected with sources and things like that. It, it, those are all very positive steps. I'd also say that, um, you know, mainstream outlets gravitating towards wrestling coverage uh, offer, uh, creates opportunities for much better media coverage where you have real journalists with real strong backing getting a chance to do real reporting on the wrestling industry. Look at the Wall Street Journal stories and the Vince McMahon stories. That was, those were broken by a major, major news outlet with professional journalists, not a news aggregation site. Um, you can even look at things like Variety and Hollywood Reporter and these other, um, you know, news outlets that have covered the pro wrestling industry. Some of the pieces are good. Some of the pieces are bad, but it's real honest media coverage in a lot of cases by major media organizations. And that is much stronger than historically what we have seen uh, covering the pro wrestling industry in the past. And there's room for more of that. And we've seen, you know, entities like Sports Illustrated dedicate you know, someone to covering pro wrestling all the time. And we can see maybe more of that coming in the future. Um, so those are, those are strong points for optimism. And, you know, it wasn't like it was great in the nineties, right? Like Mark Madden and Bubba the Love Sponge were heavy hitters of wrestling media in the 1990s. Like it wasn't like, you know, we, we, we had only great people in the nineties and now we have all these new people that don't know what they're doing. We had plenty of people that don't know what they're doing. We had like the lowest of the low having prominent voices in wrestling media, uh, you know, back then too. So, uh, it's not like, uh, you know, we're in some sort of new age where wrestling media has gone down the tubes. It's, it's always a work in progress because there's a general lack of professionalism, uh, in the coverage of it, because most of the people that are covering it are not professionals and they're not trained professionals and they've never been in the newsroom in their life. Um, but, you know, maybe as, as time goes on, those people will gain more experience and they'll be better at their jobs. And we'll see more mainstream outlets dedicate real coverage to pro wrestling because there's a growing appetite for it uh, and the audience is willing to read it. And if that's the case, people are going to continue to cover it because that's where their eyeballs are. And that's what everyone wants in pro wrestling. Um. This is our last question. Um, I saved this one for last because it's multifaceted. And it was asked by Alan 4 l um, who many of you people are probably familiar with uh, for his work with Pro Wrestling Torch and other outlets. Um, it's also Avengers 23 also asked a very similar question. So I'm kind of lumping both of them into asking this question. But this is from Alan. And he says, if you could make the following changes for AEW and New Japan respectively, what would they be? And he lists one production change one booking change, and one personnel change. So I'll start with AEW. I'll answer all three for AEW, and then I'll do all three for Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, AEW, a production change in, in AEW. A lot of people would just say, be better at production, uh, production right? If there seems to be an issue every week with, um, you know, guys, you know, doing take 23 and leaving that in the in the pre-tape uh, um, skit uh audio issues cameras missing things all that kind of stuff i think most people would just say be better at productive uh be better at production but to give a specific example something i would like to see i would like to see uh you if you have a main event um if you have a match as your main event which AEW often does uh the nice you know end the match at like 9 57 p.m eastern time and then have that nice two or three minute post-match at the end of the show they've done this a few times kind of accidentally like someone it goes short and they have to kind of 
fill time at the end of the show. But I kind of like that. It feels more organic. And I think it, it allows both the result of the main event match to sink in, you know, more than like you do a pinfall and then 10 seconds later, you know, the logo is flashing and we're, we're going off the air. Um, it also provides an opportunity for Excalibur to hype the, you know, next week's card and things like that in a, in an easy way as they're kind of going off the air and the guys are celebrating and things like that. It's much more similar to how like real sports are presented. Uh, you know, if, if a, a guy doesn't, you know, uh, in an NBA game, if the, uh, a guy doesn't hit a game winning shot and then five seconds later, they're off the air, right? Uh, there's a post game. There might be a post game interview. There might be, uh, you know, the announcers kind of recap what they saw in the game and things like that. It, it feels more natural. I think it's better for presenting the product, um, I've liked it when they've done it kind of accidentally, and I would like to see it kind of happen as a regular theme in AEW. Um, a booking change in AEW. I would take a page, this is something that WWE does very well, and it is putting a greater emphasis on individual stars. And they AEW does do this to a degree. They definitely do it with MJF, which if you don't like MJF, some people are not going to enjoy that, but... One of the things WWE does very well is that it has its key main stars. And when those stars are on their television shows, they're all over the television shows. They have an in-ring segment. They have a backstage promo. They they are, you know, presented. Maybe there's a recap video, all this stuff. And I think it gives off the impression of that wrestler is a bigger deal and really solidifies individual star power, individual drawing power um, in a way that, AEW doesn't always hit correctly. I think it was very telling when Cody jumped from AEW to WWE and WWE went really over the top in presenting Cody Rhodes as this big individual star. They had like the countdown clock for when he was going to appear. He was all over the show. And it made Cody feel like a bigger, huge star. And the result is Cody turned into a pretty strong individual drawing card for WWE in a way that he wasn't for AEW. And I think a lot of times AW, they book their thing where it's like, okay, we're going to have Kenny Omega on the show. He's going to have, you know, uh, this five minute segment here, or he's going to have this 15 minute match and, and that's it. And I think it'd be Kenny Omega would feel bigger if he was just, if he had two or three segments per show or John Moxley did this or Brian Danielson or Hangman Page um, and MJF and Adam Cole, they do kind of get there. Um but I just think in in you know AW has a likes to showcase a lot of people on each show. They like to have a lot of different matches. They like to to bang out through their their segments very quickly. Um, but I do think it's probably more productive in terms of creating individual drawing cards and making people feel like a bigger deal if you take some time to um, focus more on a few chosen individual stars. And when you only had dynamite. That was maybe a little bit more difficult because you had so many people on your roster. But now you have Dynamite, now you have Rampage, and now you have Collision. So you've got a lot more time each week to kind of focus on your chosen big individual stars. And um, that's something that I think you should take advantage of instead of, you know, oh, now we have more time for 25 more wrestlers to get TV time. You can say, well, now we have more time to get some of our bigger stars more over um, without having to necessarily cut anyone else that was previously being featured on the show because you have the extra two hours of collision now. Um, so that's a booking change I would do. Uh, and a personnel change, uh, just like two things. I don't I honestly think these people should be like fired, but I really would like to see like less Hardys and less Jeff Jarrett like wrestling matches on my show. I, I get that the Hardys certainly have some sort of drawing appeal still. And I get that Jeff Jarrett, like I like Jeff Jarrett's shtick, but I do not need to see those guys wrestling. And I don't have any interest in those guys wrestling in the ring. They're they're all, they're not good enough in the ring anymore to hit AEW standard. And it's often a waste. Like Ray Phoenix has an open challenge last night. And they, you know, Jeff Jarrett gets the open challenge and, you know, they wrestle a match or whatever. It's, it's a 10 minute match. Jeff Jarrett's doing all his shtick with all his guys, but it's like, you could spin a wheel of any male wrestler on that roster and probably find someone that would be much more exciting for Phoenix to wrestle in a, you know, a 10 minute TV opener match. Like have them wrestle, like, you know, have them wrestle Trent Beretta, have them wrestle, uh, even like a, you know, a young high fire, like a, um, you know, uh, 
Dante Martin, uh, or uh, I forget which one's injured and which one's not. It's either Darius. Or, I'm pretty sure Darius is injured. Um, no, no, Darius is not injured. Dante is injured. Darius Martin. Have him wrestle D- Darius Martin. Have him wrestle Lee Moriarty. Uh, you know, you could do, I don't know if you do Orange Cassie right away. I mean, uh, Wheeler, Utah. Uh, there's just so many people in AW's roster I would rather see just have a 10 minute match than Jeff Jarrett. No interest in that at this point. Just like I'm not interested in seeing Matt or Jeff Hardy at all. So those would be two people that I would like to see de-emphasized as far as in the ring uh, on AEW. Uh, New Japan, you know, it's hard to really point out like a production change I would like to, to, to pick out in New Japan. I really enjoy their production pretty much the whole way through. You know, they do have excellent camera work. Um, I think their announcers are fantastic. We'll see what happens with, you know, Kevin Kelly supposedly leaving, kind of who takes over that role. Um I just, I don't, I don't really have anything negative to say about New Japan's production. Like, I really like their shows. Um, you know, I watch most of their, I also, I do watch most of their shows uh, on, on delay, obviously. I kind of watch them on demand. So I skip through some of the the downtime and, and uh, sometimes I skip through entrances and the intermission and things like that. So I'm not necessarily always seeing the non in-ring aspects of the show, maybe those could stand for room for improvement, but it's for what new Japan is trying to do with this product. I feel like it's production is a very well-oiled machine that does everything that is designed to do. So I, I really don't have any criticisms for new Japan's production. I'd be really interested, Alan, you know, having, you, you know, I know you follow it very closely or anyone else um, to kind of tell me like what you think uh, new Japan's productions could, could, could change because that'd be kind of interesting to see that. Um, Cause I, I can't really think of anything that, I have a problem with um booking change here's a booking change for you um get rid of this g1 briefcase title defenses i hate them um i shared i shared this in the slack and it wasn't a particularly popular take but i'm not afraid to have an unpopular take um i was watching that you know like the naito versus jeff cobb match from destruction in kobe where naito is defending his you know g1 you know the the the, the tokyo dome IWGP World Heavyweight Championship title match briefcase uh, that he won by winning the G1. And as a fan, I'm like, well, there's no way that Jeff Cobb is main eventing the Tokyo Dome and not Tetsuya Naito. So there's just completely no way that Naito could ever lose this match in a million years. And I get it that a few years ago, you know, Kota Ibushi lost his title uh, shot to Jay White, but that was different because I... First of all, Jay White was much higher on the higher on the hierarchy than um, Jeff Cobb is, so it was more believable that he could win that match. But also at the same time, they had to do like a convoluted booking awkward thing where because they needed two Tokyo Dome main events, you know, Jay White one night and then Kota Ibushi the next night. So I just you know it, it kills the match because I don't believe in any of the near falls that they're having because Jeff Cobb obviously is not going to win this match. Um, and it just it, it it seems like a really unnecessary booking handcuff. Um, I get it. it. It adds theoretically, it adds a big match to one of your fall shows by having him have to defend his you know his his title shot. But it's just I mean it's just so much simpler where you win the G one and you're wrestling at the Tokyo Dome. We don't need to see him defend that title shot. I would rather just like lazily suggest something like, you know, maybe Naito needs to you know maybe sonata the current iwgp champion picks three challengers that naito has to face um and he doesn't necessarily naito doesn't have to necessarily have to win those matches but just he has these three challenges that he has to fight through um before he gets to the tokyo dome just to make sure that he has to go through something and he could do those matches or something like that i don't think you need to have this title shot on the line say like this title shot isn't on the line and you just do jeff cobb versus tetsuya naito it's possible then that cobb could beat naito and then maybe naito gets his win back in october or november at one of those shows um as kind of like this obstacle he overcomes on his way to the tokyo dome as opposed to the title shots on the line so nobody thinks it's going to change i just get rid of it. it it's never been interesting it always feels like it's a handicap to what they want to do um goodbye goodbye you know g1 briefcase goodbye title shot online don't need any of that uh and lastly the personnel change uh for a uh, for new japan sorry uh i would just i look at that roster i just said you know move on from some of this dead weight um bad luck fale toro yano yujiro 
um, Takahashi, like, uh, nothing personal against those guys. They've served their purpose for New Japan over the years. And, you know, New Japan, for the most part, keeps people around uh, no matter what and keeps booking them. But realistically, like, do I ever need to see any of those guys wrestle again? I don't. Um, and New Japan should be such a competitive environment for spots and consistent getting consistent bookings and things like that. And there's so much talent out there uh, that I don't know if you just can have all of these guys sticking around forever. Um, and like, I get it. There's a loyalty aspect. There's a, there's a whole Japanese business model. That's, that's very different than how we would approach things here. Um, so I understand what they're doing, but as far as like a personal change, I would like to see, it was like these people that I will never be excited to see wrestle a match ever again, do not have to be a new Japan pro wrestling. Um, that's just a personal change that I would make. Um, all right. So uh, I did make it through all the questions. Again, these were all excellent questions and I really appreciate everyone sending them in. Um, I, this went really well. So I hope to do more of them, probably not for a little while, but it's always nice to kind of field some different questions. I've always loved, you know, mailbags from my favorite writers and my favorite podcasters. So it's great to see um, so many people interested in what I have to say and asking such good questions that really um, got me thinking about uh, things. It's a very productive thought exercise too. Like if I think about, you know, some of the topics we discussed today would actually make great individual episodes, I think, because there's a lot of big picture stuff that we discussed. So I um, appreciate it. Appreciate everyone who's been listening. And I'll talk to you all again after a while. Hola, hola. My name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish-speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. Hey kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network.